in the regions beyond the land of the Celts. There lies in the ocean an island no smaller than Sicily. It is situated in the north and inhabited by the Hyperboreans. The island is both fertile and productive of every crop and has an unusually temperate climate. Diodorus Siculus on Hyperborea. Just as Plato had cited the Egyptian legend of the sunken island of Atlantis, the Greek historian Herodotus mentioned the Egyptian legend continent of Hyperborea in the far north. When ice destroyed this great land, it said its people migrated south. The Hyperboreans. Hence the name, the places they migrated to, Scandinavia, Bavaria, Samaria, Ireland, and Romania, Bulgaria, Sweden, Northern Europe, British Isles. I never thought about that before. Very few Hyperboreans went to the Southern Hemisphere. The few that managed to trickle down to the Southern Hemisphere seemed to do so unimpeded. Writing in 1679, the Swedish author Olaf Rudback identified the Proto-Atlanteans with the Hyperboreans and located the latter at the North Pole that lay far to the north of Thrace. They came from the North Country, beyond the North Winds. One thing I know is that we are here on Earth. If you try to provide any explanation, any way, how we got here, you're ready to be thrown in the nut bin. Just our presence alone signifies an event where something magical took place. At some place during some time in this universe, consciousness became matter and matter became conscious now, wouldn't that imply a supernatural event it means the universe is magic i don't mean the alistair crowley way although some seem to go there for reasons i will never know but the good way real way through altruism love and understanding how many cataclysms there were we don't know but the last one was a doozy had they heeded the forewarning they could still be around. Especially in light of the fact of what's being found on Mars, which we will be taking a look at a little later. The Golden Age could have lasted for thousands of years, but sadly, the only thing inevitable is change. There were spiritual Yodas. By the time they were into Europe, they lived a harsh and brutal, short-lived existence. The average age one lived to would be the ripe old age of 35, if they were lucky. Their land became a land of ice and snow, brought on by the cataclysm, at least one of the final ones or the that was unfolding in the sky. I think it's possible that the cataclysm caused post-traumatic stress syndrome to an all-time high and human beings for a time turned into homicidal maniacs, crazy people. Well, you're gonna have to get outside the box a little bit for this one. In order to think outside the box, one has to kind of get outside the box. So if, to do that, you have to use your right brain for this one because I'm trying to connect a few dots and this is a story of de-evolution from Hyperborea to the Vikings. And you have to ask yourself one question. While the Vikings were running around, tear-assing around Europe, looting and burning and pillaging 
Where were the armies? Well, that's a good question. I don't know this for sure, but maybe there wasn't any. And the Vikings were the reason why nations ended up getting a military to prevent it from happening again. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's kind of a story of why a lot of things that we used to enjoy, we don't anymore because people ruin it for themselves. You can't even have a mirror in a men's bathroom without some numbskull coming in and busting it. Then what happens? A rule gets put in place to prevent it from happening again. Just a hunch, just a thought of mine. So, okay, here we go. I first, I put the linguist first to get the wording right, and then we can go from there. This is gonna be a good one. As my neighbor sets off his fireworks in the background, <clears throat> you always know when the 4th of July is near. For some, the um, period, periodic uh, symbol is AU or U, Urus, Ur. This is the land of Ur, Aries, Ur, where the Aryans come from come from, the Iranians, Sumerians, yeah. um, Irish people, Iron Man, okay, Eris, because this is where creation comes from, it comes from the star called Anu in the uh, constellation of Triangulum, which corresponds to the pineal gland, uh, which is in Eris. There are three stars in Triangulum, the triangle shape of the pineal gland. One is Anu at the top and Enlil and Ye at the bottom, okay, which correspond to Uranus, Saturn and Jupiter, okay. And that's where Ur, the land of Ur is in, in Aries, arising on the horizon every day. Horus rising. This one here, again, pure syncretism. That's the rune of Thor, TH. So, Fu, Thark. You see the word Ark there, A R C. Okay? Thor with his Taurus fields, Thorus fields. And you can see that's the Taurus field. Okay? That's the letter V, which is vortex or Thortex. What's a vortex? A Taurus field, which is a vortex, because vor and thor are interchangeable. Um, and so arc is there, of course, because this is the archetype, archetypal science of the 12 signs. As this is the same, so the letter P, of course, if that's the key ro, and it's actually the letter R in Greek, but it's actually P, um, which corresponds with the Mystery Initiation Secret Schools. It, the, those symbols, that's why you find, why do you find doctors use the caduceus of Hermes or the staff of Apollo as their symbol for so-called medicine that they practice? Well, because that caduceus is the same as this. It has power. The letter P has power. It's, what's, it's the letter of initiation and secrets. There's, there's a reason why Perth, Perth, that word, that sound and mystery and initiation and secrets is there. It resembles birch, burr. So burr is an anagram of br, and br is abrasion, abraxas, brahma, abraham, abra. Kadabra, Debra, the prophetess who speaks with her labra in Italian for lips. Okay, and in Spanish we say habla, with R and L being interchangeable, would be that when they speak, instead of saying habla, they are saying abra. Yeah, Spanish, hablar, español. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm labouring the point here and giving you tangents and, and connections so that you can really embed these meanings in your mind. B means growth. That's why Eve, 
A is Atom, Adam, alone in the paradise, sterile, no kids. B, both, is Eve, even, the binary code. So when B, Eve, even, Adam's partner comes along, you have growth. Two represents doubling. Growth, it's a no-brainer. Yeah? Yeah. Two, yeah, Absolutely. and that's why Eve divided yeah. with her evil influence yeah. the world. Yeah. Because the other two divides. All feminine numbers, even numbers, divide. Two, four, six, eight, ten, straight down the middle. Masculine numbers, odd, atom numbers, are atomic. You can't divide them. One, three, five, seven, nine, etc. So Eve is the divider, the evil woman. Eve, Venus. Okay. Kano, Kano, opening, torch, canoe, as in boat. Clarity, of course, clarity. And notice that every time Kano turns up, or in, uh, um, in the alphabet, it's followed by a very important letter. K-L, K-R, clarity, Christ, cl, cl, cr, cr. So you've got the two liquids are always preceded by a k sound. Because it's, it's the number three. It's the trinity. So the three lights produce cl, cr, which are the two halves of electrical force. Redshift, blue shift. Electron, proton. Pr, pro is ra. So if you put an I in between PR, you get pyroton. That tells you exactly what the proton is. It's a fire. Red, ah, pra, vibrating proton. Yeah? And the electron is doing the other liquid half. That's electricity. Listen to your electrical stations when you drive by. You'll hear it. The transformers? Yeah. You'll hear that liquid vibration, yeah? yeah? That's creation. It's energy. Okay. So we're coming to uh, Dagas. Nice one. Uh, breakthrough. The letter D. Breakthrough. Does that look like a torus field to you? A vortex uh, centred by centered by transcendental um, counter-spatial counter magnetic dielectric black and white light. The D, door, the Taurus field, the delta, the Dalet in Hebrew, the door. That's what it means in Hebrew, Dalet, the door. Well, well um, you know, the day. The breakthrough, go through the door. The dagger, transform. Well, what's the Taurus field doing? Transforming bodies. Sublimating. Alchemically. Transmuting. Tra, tra, Torah. Transform is Torah. Yeah? Transmuting. And so, D is a transforming letter. In fact, it's the number four, which is death. D, death. The doorway to the ether. Ether being the next letter, the fifth letter, the quintessence. Interesting how D goes before it in the word amazing. death. Just amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. The door to the ether. When you die, you go back to the quintessence, yeah? Cool. The ether. Field. Well, these are all hearkening to an original homeland. And uh, that actually if you do your homework, and we're abbreviating everything here, but if you've done your homework, you'll find out that this was actually a location touted to be in the extreme north, Ultima Tula, as the, as the, the Germanic tu Teutonics people called it. Um, Hyperbore Hyperborea, for instance, you know, but just basically the cradle of civilization, a lost prehistoric circumpolar continent. So it's not just talking about Finland, it's not just talking about Scandinavia or Britain, you know, all the references talk about it. They know of those lands and they say, oh, but it's even, it's even further there. 
And then what has to be understood is it's an anti-type or ante-type, right? Before the types, so like an archetype. Uh, that all these other references that appear, even your Garden of Eden story, actually, which itself is derivative. It didn't it didn't turn up in the Bible uh, for the first time. The story of a sacred garden, a sacred place. Where did that motif come from? It's an antitype. Well, there's antitypes of the antitypes because the hanging gardens of Babylon, you know, the whole idea of a sacred grove, a sacred place uh, is very, very, very key to uh, mythology. And I would say that even, why is it that when we're looking to God, you know, even you cast your eyes up when somebody's uh, making a remark and you're like rolling your eyes, you look up at God, God help me. You know? And we see it in many different ancient cultures. Even when you think of, uh, you know, I, I was researching the ancient legend of Shambhala when I was doing my sort of warrior presentation. And you know, just the idea that there was this enlightened, powerful, empowered culture uh, that, you know, used to exist. And they used to think it was out in the mountains of Tibet or whatever. But I, I also compared it to the idea that this was an elevated form of consciousness that maybe once did exist, or maybe it was the ancients that were yearning for that, you know, even in their present time, you know, that, hey, once upon a time, in a faraway land, in an ancient time, there was a, a better knowledge about where we came from, why we're here, what's the purpose of life. And then you read the Arthurian legends, the Celtic legends, the Nordic legends, the Teutonic legends, the Celtic legends, and they're all talking about uh, the Hyperborea, extreme north. You know, that's what we call the north wind, Boreas. It just means, that, you know, then you have a character in the King Arthur and legend called Sir Bors. Deganus, because if you decode all the knights, like Sir Galahad, Sir Tristram, they all represent archetypes. And it's one of the most interesting things you can do. I don't even think it's been done that well. Same like, you know, the Lord of the Rings characters or whatever. But even the Arthurian le legend characters are archetypes in themselves. They mean so much when you unpack them. But as I said, Tula or Ultima Tula, the extreme north, right? You have uh, Avalon, the island of the apples. You have Asgard or As, uh, As being gods and Gord being garden, the garden of the gods, Asgard to the Nordics, Hesperides to the Greeks. So you have the garden of Aru, A-A-R-U, right? From Egypt, the garden of Aru, what, what's that? Paradiso, right, paradise. Then you have Agartha. Remember you mentioned Shambhala, right? You have Olympus, gods living in a mountain. Why, why are they living in a mountain? Why don't they live in a valley, uh, on a plain, what's, or in the middle of an island? Or what's this, all gods live on their mountain? See, again, we, we, we fail to look at the phenomenology of these things as instances and, and what they tell us. Parnassus, you know, we can put links below, but people need to look at Nemeton, the great Celtic Nemeton, sacred grove of the goddess, the, the king of the grove, Nematona, right? Uh, Nematona, look it up. Or in uh, more famous Irish legends, the famous Isles of Youth, not one, many. The sacred isles, uh, mysterious otherworldly isles, you know, like the the story of Ocean, and he goes and lives with the princess on the Isle of Eternal Youth and all of this uh, amazing stuff. Who would ever dream of? Is it fantasy? Islands of youth? Islands of immortality? Right. In Sumeria, we have their whole concept of the gardens, but also that the gods live on a mountain, a mountainous abode. You have Apollo. His name actually comes from Appel, which is apple, our, our modern word apple, because he's from the, the place of the grove and the apples, the sacred apples, the sacred precinct. In fact, he's the god of that. Avalon, as I said, means, you know, Isle of Apples. Uh, in Sumeria, Sargon, one of the first archetypal kings, the famous king Sargon, the very name. But you see, look at what we have today. You just said something really incredible, and that is that when, when because these myths, when we're talking myth, you're talking racial memory. So it's not out there in book form. It's in here, in living blood. When you see today yeah. these national fantasies or national social contagions like Flat Earth coming out, what the people who are obsessed, you know, up to the eyeballs in it, don't realize is what, what why they'd be attracted to a, a fallacy like that. It's because it harkens back to this Arctic homeland. Uh, when you do not process the truth, when the truth is hidden from man, as we know it has been in this one instance, say, Arctic homeland, but can we list all the other places that has been hidden as well? But let's just confine ourselves to this. Then truth will out, as the Bible says. So when the real truth has been hidden from you, but your, sen your inner senses know it's been hidden from you, it comes out in a warped way. And it comes out in a public, hysterical manner. 
where there's a seed of truth and people are kind of trying to cling to that. So to that point, there's a virtue. But unfortunately, the trappings of it, the means of explanation of it, the reason has, has run, is running riot. So w what I'm trying to do is uh, say, when you know what's been suppressed, what people even of great eminence got wrong, if you can look at the thing rationally and understand it, you will, under, you will, you will be able to open that Aladdin, Aladdin's cave and get to the actual facts. And then that will stop all these national contagions and, and the furore, the hysteria, you know, that uh, makes you obsessively interested in it. Because that then turns out to be pathological and not particularly sane. So the flat earth is based, you know, some of the, the images that they show that are meant to look like this flat dome with a globe, that's the Arctic homeland, sorry folks. And it wasn't because the, the, even the Arctic homeland was a flat plane. It wasn't, that's just a metaphor for a particular realm. It's a metaphor. And then the dome above its head is not a real plastic dome or any kind of dome. That's just the night sky, which was the central theater of operation to, the, to, to, these, uh, to Polaria, the, the, the inhabitants of Polaria. And this was a shorthanded way, these diagrams, you know, of, of, of describing that. It never was meant to describe the whole earth or the shape of the whole earth. So, you know, again, but this is actually a very simple truth, actually. So when you see people running with a particular fantasy and you say, but stop, stop, you've just forgotten the keys, you've left the door open, or can I explain to you where this originated? And they're not interested. Then after the horse is bolted, after, you know, after the chariot race begins and the screaming crowds, you can't stand up there and scream to the, till your lungs are bursted. You know, it's like a, uh, having that model of knowing how to get this product out to people, uh, uh, serve mankind, don't serve a bunch of nincompoops who are at the end of their psychic life. This, this has waylaid the whole of science, and they've waylaid us in return. This has waylaid nations. See, if you go to the East, right, some of my family members are from there, none of these people ever have a doubt of telling you where the high aria came from. It's only in the West that you get this cognitive dissonance. Nobody in China or Northern India or many other places have any doubt about where the civilizers came from, the Northwest. In fact, it was, it was a given that even in Turkey, in the Middle East, in Egypt, Osiris came from the West, from the lands of the dead, but the lands of the dead were blessed by Nazis, but even later scholars, is that the Vedas, like what I'm saying about the Eastern people, contradicted the, the, the sacred cow. The Vedas don't say that the gods of the Vedas came from the East. The Vedas say they came from the North. Oh yeah, the whole mind by the very Puranas and the Vedas. And in fact, unintelligible parts of these documents, you know, the, uh, not, well, this is the Vedas, the, the Puranas, but other Eastern texts, in fact, even all the Persian texts, right, called the Avesta. All these Persian texts always cite the North, Never where they are. This is the most interesting thing. So kind of temporal constancy, you know, because this is before the fall. This is what we call the golden age. We'll get into more detail in a minute about the seasons, right? But just what should be emphasized now is the sense of constancy. Because if that was the ver perpetuum, right, the uh, eternal spring with a temperate climate, everything on tap for the people, uh, no inhibitions, as in, you know, Adam and Eve and their nakedness, and then they had to cover their nakedness. So there's a bit of a tantric tie in there, which interested William Blake. We'll get to that in a minute as well. But the idea that uh, there was a feeling of constancy and regularity, and that regularity in itself was, a, was the sign of paradise. That was the sign of man and nature being in harmony. And then the subsequent loss of that, which is the pole shift, right? Then is the loss of the homeland. And all the imagery and symbolism of this reversal, it's not really a reversal, it's just a small pole shift, but it came into, you know, later, it, it was exaggerated, and it, it, uh, got, uh, it got allegorized as, as a total reversal. <laughs>